For a long time, it was believed that the history of Japan began with the Jomon period, 14,000 BC to 300 BC, an era famous for the unique way in which the population of the time decorated ceramic pieces. But in 1946, Tadahiro Aizawa discovered a microlith, a very small stone tool, in Iwajuku, and this discovery lifted the veil that obscured the preceding period, the Japanese Paleolithic. From 1946 to the present day, thousands of Paleolithic sites have been located, but despite this abundance, little is known about this very distant era. This is because the Japanese soil has a lot of volcanic ash in its composition, which makes it extremely acidic and capable of disintegrating organic material, such as bones, animal skins and wooden tools. It is therefore through the analysis of lithic remains, this is, those made of stone, that we can uncover the past. This does not mean that human remains have not been discovered at all. At the archaeological site of Nagata, the Amakita human bones were unearthed and recognized as being between 14,000 and 18,000 years old. In Minatogawa, 18,000 year old fossilized remains were found. Excavations in Ishigaki resulted in the bones of at least 19 different people being recovered, which allowed for the almost complete reconstruction of a 27,000 year old male skeleton. And of all the oldest, the bones of Yamashita Dojin, an 8 year old girl, were retrieved from a cave in Okinawa. These bones are estimated to be 32,500 years old. Although there is some evidence to suggest that human occupation of the Japanese archipelago began earlier than 35,000 BC, this evidence is not uh, universally accepted by the scientific community. So this is the date we will consider for the arrival of men on the islands. All these aspects and many more have already been covered in my last video in full detail. So if you're interested, don't forget to visit the video either after this one or before, which makes more sense chronologically. Last time we answered the question, when did humanity arrive in Japan? Now let's understand who these people were, how they reached the islands and how they are related to modern Japanese. Finally, in the next and last video about this era, we will look into the Paleolithic lifestyle. Firstly, we have to understand that the Japanese Paleolithic community was almost certainly very heterogeneous. It is probable that various populations, coming from the most diverse places, migrated to these islands around the same time. This is during the last glacial maximum. And together formed the concept of the Paleolithic man, who would later come to be called Jomon. Therefore, the Jomon are like an evolution of the Paleolithic people, who acquired this name once they began to create ceramic pieces. Anyway, when studies use the word heterogeneous, it's a clear sign that the subject in question is going to become complicated. It's always a challenge to transform academic material into something more digestible, so I apologize for one or two oversimplifications. Today we are going to analyze the three routes believed to be responsible for the arrival of early men in Japan and understand the evidence-based reasoning behind each of them. The first departs from Taiwan and terminates in the islands of Okinawa. The second originates in Korea and is headed towards Kyushu. Finally, the third and last suggests a passage from Russia to Hokkaido. Let's start precisely from the south, since this route has something that sets it apart from the other two. As I explained in the previous video, during the last ice age, the sea level was substantially lower than it is today, around 150 meters which at one point connected the Japanese archipelago to the Asian continent. Thus, in the region known today as the Korean Strait and the Tsushima Strait, there was a land bridge connecting the two countries, at least partially, which would make a sea crossing easy. Land bridges also connected Sakhalin in Russia and Hokkaido, as well as linking Hokkaido and Honshu, which is Japan's main island. But someone wishing to leave Taiwan and reach Okinawa couldn't just cross a bridge. They would have to resort to other means. The sea level was lower, yes, but not low enough to connect Taiwan and Japan, not even partially. So here's why this route is quite different from the other two. How did primitive men get to Okinawa if not via a bridge? Let me refresh your memory by repeating something I said in the last video. 
Although there is some disagreement about the date, it is widely accepted that Homo sapiens emerged in Africa and that it soon ventured beyond the limits of this continent in search for new territories. The best known and most important of these migrations, known as Out of Africa II, took place around 70,000 years ago. Although this date is another that generates a lot of controversy. And aware that their steps would be studied thousands of years later, Homo sapiens moved on and on until they reached Southeast Asia around 50,000 years ago. The islands that form Indonesia today and the regions that surround it were at that time part of the continent. And this land was given the name of Sunderland, considered one of the great cradles of humanity. In this promising location, the population grew and developed. The construction of boats allowed people to get food from the sea and expand even further. It was only a matter of time before the Australian continent was colonized. Other groups continued to migrate to China, Siberia, the American continent and, of most interest to us today, the Japanese archipelago. With regard to the colonization of the central Ryukyu Islands, two hypotheses emerge. One theorizes that the primitive men who inhabited southern China migrated eastwards until they reached Okinawa. Another suggests that they first migrated south to Sunderland before heading north and coming across the central Ryukyu Islands. Either way, both theories are based on the fact that the stone tools of the Paleolithic people of Ryukyu resemble those used by the people of Taiwan, northern Indochina and southeast Asia. Further evidence can be found when we look at the fossilized teeth that have been recovered to date. Southeast Asian populations have a peculiar shape of teeth called Sundadonti, as opposed to the Sinodonti dentition. Many differences separate these two dentitions, but the most famous is observable in the incisors. In the Sinodentition, the front teeth have a shovel-shaped indentation at the back, which is absent in the sun dentition. Sinodonti is common in Koreans and Chinese, for example, while Sundadonti can be found in the indigenous peoples of Taiwan, Filipinos, Indonesians, Borneans and Malays. Incidentally, the names of these two types of teeth reveal their origin, with Sino referring to China and Sun being short for Sunderland. The Paleolithic people of central Ryukyu had sun teeth, a characteristic they shared with the people of Southeast Asia, so it's logical to think that it was the latter who gave rise to them. In 2013, Dr. Yozuki Kaifu, head of the Human Evolution Division at Japan's National Museum of Nature and Science, began planning a project whose aim was to uncover how the Paleolithic man was able to reach the Japanese islands from Taiwan. The project involved more than 60 researchers from various fields of science, marine explorers and management teams from Japan, Taiwan and New Zealand. After much deliberation, the team decided to test three types of boat, one made from reeds, another from bamboo and the third made from wood. At the time, it was possible to build any of these three. The first boat to be tested in 2016 was the one built from reeds. The species used in the construction were Tifa domingensis purse and Flagellaria indica L, both native to the island of Yonaguni. The aim was to reach Yiriomote Island, but the two rafts were carried away by the ocean current. In 2017 and 2018, two versions of bamboo boats were tested. Although they proved surprisingly stable, the slow speed at which they crossed the water proved insufficient to combat the Kuroshio current. Stone tipped axes, a recreation of a Paleolithic tool believed to be around 38,000 years old, were then used to cut down trees a meter thick and carve the wood obtained into a boat. Tests immediately showed that these new boats were faster and more durable than their reed and bamboo predecessors. It was with these boats, seven and a half meters long, that the 225 kilometers crossing between Taiwan and Yonaguni Island were shipped. A crossing that began on July 7, 2019 and ended 45 hours later. There were four men and one woman steering the pedals, and they didn't have access to any modern navigation tool, like compasses, maps, GPS, smartphones, watches, and others. We now know who colonized the central Ryukyu Islands, but when we look a little further north, 
A few details stand out, including the fact that the Paleolithic people who lived on the northern Ryukyu Islands and in Kyushu used a very different set of stone tools from those of the Paleolithic people of South or Southeast Asia, and therefore also different from those used by the inhabitants of the central Ryukyu Islands. This indicates that these places were colonized in a different way. One sharp object in particular, resembling a knife, looked similar to another produced on the mainland of Korea. So this means that the Paleolithic people of Kyushu and northern Ryukyu Islands must have reached Japan via the Korean peninsula, the second of the three routes I already mentioned. However, it should be mentioned that these people, like those from Ryukyu in the south, had Sandadonti dentition, not Korean Sinodonti. How is that possible? Experts suggest that inhabitants of Kyushu and northern Ryukyu are also descendant from the people of Southeast Asia, but from the part of these people who migrated first to the northeast of the continent and then to Korea, before finally entering Japan. They would therefore bring with them their dental morphology, but also the technology of Korea. Several thousand years later, the Paleolithic Japanese of Kyushu began to expand, and so colonized the island of Shikoku and other parts of mainland Japan. All that remains is to talk about the third road, the introduction of primitive men to Hokkaido from Sakhalin. It is believed that these nomads arrived in the northern region of Japan by chasing mammoths, bisons, Nauman elephants, Irish elk and other large animals across the land bridges over the Soya and Suguru Straits. But how did these men end up in northern Asia in the first place? To answer this question, we have to go back in time and turn our eyes once again to Africa, the cradle of humanity. We already know that the Out of Africa 2 event took place around 70,000 BC and that one group headed southeast, eventually reaching Sunderland. But another group ventured north around 50,000 years ago. This group was called the Eurasians. The Eurasians split up at some point, with some heading west, Western Eurasians, that will become the ancestors of Europeans, and others heading east, Eastern Eurasians. So, you might think that the people from the north who came to Japan were those Eastern Eurasians, but you would be mistaken. Some of the men who went west decided, for whatever reason, to separate from the rest of the group and go back at around 38,000 BC. But instead of following the path of their eastern colleagues, they decided to venture into the Arctic Circle instead, in the middle of the Ice Age, which is a wise decision, no doubt about it. Along the way to Japan, these Western Eurasians met Eastern Eurasians on multiple occasions, which led to some mixing of DNA. The populations that resulted from those crossings became known as the ancient Northern Siberians, the arrival of the last glacial maximum made living conditions unbearably harsh for these people, who were forced to migrate south in pursuit of the prey on which their livelihood depended. Part of these Norse people discovered Alaska when they crossed a land bridge over the Bering Strait around 13,500 years ago, after which they moved south and reached the rest of North America. Others arrived in Japan perhaps 25,000 years ago, and began to occupy the southern regions of Japan around 20,000 years ago, contributing to the formation of Japanese Paleolithic men, which would later become the Jomon. This contribution would also explain why both the shape of the skull and the facial structures of the Jomon people are more similar to those of Americans and Europeans than those of mainland Asians. Of course, this is just one version of the story. If the very date of humanity's arrival in Japan is debatable, the exact order of the migrations is even more debatable. I won't pretend to know the answer, because not even science reached a consensus on when each group arrived on the main island of Japan or which group was the dominant one. Thanks to Yamashita Dojin, the girl's fossil found in Okinawa, we know that Southeast Asian people colonized southern Japan at least 32,500 years ago, but it's hard to say when the population decided to explore beyond the Ryukyu Islands. I've seen dates as late as 12,000 BC for the arrival of these people on Japan's main island. 
As for the migration via the Korean Peninsula, the general idea is that it happened quite early. Dr. Yozuki Kaifu, the same person who planned the sea crossing I mentioned earlier, suggests that the migration took place around 38,000 years ago, because there is evidence that the Paleolithic man might have carried obsidian for using tools from the island of Kozushima to the mainland around this time, which implies that Onshu was already being occupied. There also seems to have been hunting of large mammals in the Lake Noji region between 33,000 and 39,000 years ago. If true, however, this could imply that primitive humans didn't rely so heavily on the oft-mentioned land bridges to cross the Tsushima Strait. Since 38,000 years ago, the peak of the glacial maximum was yet to be reached. Finally, the most controversial is undoubtedly the migration or migrations of those coming from the north, northeast of Asia. Some scholars even believe that this migration was the first of the three and suggests that the first arrivals from Siberia took place 40,000 years ago. The most popular theory, however, proposes a date of around 25,000 years ago and it was this theory that I decided to present earlier which places this migration further ahead of the others on the timescale, which is in line with the discoveries made in the field of Paleolithic microblade technology. Microblades were small splinters, less than 50 mm, obtained from the shipping of silica-rich stones, such as flint, quartz and obsidian. These splinters were then used to cover spears, which resulted in a kind of barbed spear, very effective for hunting purposes. It is said that these who were possibly the first settlers in Japan from the Korean Peninsula made the Kanto region in the east their central territory. These men bought with them the art of producing microblades, a skill they kept in their possession as they spread to other places in Japan. When they reached the south of Hokkaido, however, some 20,000 years ago, they encountered the ancient Siberians, who were coming down. The two already had microblade technology, different from that of the people from Korea. And so, while the first began in Kanto as spread and spread north, this one from the Siberia also spread south, eventually reaching Kyukshu. Regardless of who came first or who came later, the important thing is that these people who came from the most diverse regions contributed to the formation of the Japanese Paleolithic men, who later earned the name Jomon. Although they are not the direct ancestors of the modern Japanese people, it was they who inhabited the islands of Japan for the longest time, perhaps from 40,000 BC to 300 BC. For around 40,000 years, this primitive man had a home in Japan. It is believed that the decline of the Jomon people was a gradual process, culminating with the arrival of a new, more successful population who came to replace them. But this doesn't mean that nothing remained of them. It is estimated that modern Japanese have around 10% of Jomon ancestry. And the genetic links between the indigenous people of northern Japan, which are called the Ainu, and the Jomon are even closer. So continue this journey with me and we'll discover which other two groups contributed their DNA to modern Japanese men. But for now, let's take a step back again, because we have yet to see how the Paleolithic man lived his day-to-day -day life. I'm looking forward to see you next time.